to Unboxing Fulfillment, the modern B2C fulfillment podcast. I'm your host, Chad Rzeka. Our guest today is Kate Peterson, a 12-year veteran of the supply chain technology industry. Kate leads the global product marketing team for Locus Robotics, so she sits at that intersection of what today's customers need in a warehouse automation solution and what Locus brings to the market. Kate has seen many, many robotic deployments firsthand. I think she's in Amsterdam today, including our own here at Amware Fulfillment. And we thought our small community of fulfillment nerds, as we like to call ourselves here at the podcast, could learn a little bit from her experience. So Kate, welcome to the Unboxing Fulfillment Podcast. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate you accommodating my time schedule being in Amsterdam tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. I guess maybe we can just get right into it. I think there's a lot of excitement for this particular podcast. Could you just maybe introduce Locus Robotics to the audience? Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you who don't know Locus Robotics, we are a AMR or autonomous mobile robot provider. We focus primarily on the retail and distribution e-commerce 3PL in terms of picking, packing, put away through your fulfillment. What we are moving more towards is the automation of your facility. So we make it as easy and as painless as possible to drop in automation to really double and triple your productivity in your warehouse. So that's a little bit about what we do. So I think, Kate, the automation topic is just exploding and it means different things to different people. But why do you think, from your perspective, why automation is taken on so aggressively here as of late? I think there's a few things going on in the market. We're hearing from customers, from analysts, from the media. We really have several pressures. The number one top of mind is really labor. It's the cost of labor. It's the availability of labor. We have a lot of our customers that have these open warehouse positions that they just can't fill, right? And it takes more people to fill those jobs. And the turnover is a lot higher. The competition is higher based off of a warehouse down the road might offer 50 cents more per hour and those staff members leave the customer site. So labor pressures are really, really big. I also think the workforce is changing. The way people work is changing. So a lot less people are thinking about warehousing as a career to go into. They're thinking more about digital careers and those types of things. So labor, I think, is definitely number one. We're seeing in terms of SLAs and customer requirements with the Amazon effect and all of the other things that retailers are offering, it's really becoming a challenge for distributors and 3PLs to meet those requirements, whether it's shipping time, accuracy time, ability to handle returns, just the pure volume of everything going through. And then I think one of the big ones that has really come to light as a result of the pandemic, but continues as we see these disruptions in the supply chain and these changes in the economic factors, is this volatility in the market. Supply and demand is a little bit all over the place, whether it's a TikTok trend that's driving demand or whether it's a recessionary fear that's driving an overflow of supply. So all of those factors together are really causing people to look at automation as a way to future-proof their warehouse, but also do it in a time-effective and cost-effective way so that they're not having to buy and build massive amounts of warehousing and warehouse space in order to handle the fulfillment needs of today tomorrow, and then next week, because that can all look very different depending on which customer you have. I don't know from your point of view, what you see. Mine is the organizations that invest into technology kind of continue to go all in. They continue to invest after they get that first deployment of an AMR or whatever it may be, but only about five or you know somewhere between five and 10% of warehouses are actually automated. Why do you think that is considering all of those benefits that you just laid out, why are some companies or a lot of companies just still slow to automate? You know, it's an interesting question because I was having this conversation earlier today, particularly as it relates to both Europe and the US, but we're starting to see this inflection point. If you think about technology adoption, whether it was WMS 10, 15 years ago, and now we're talking about it in terms of automation, we're starting to think of it now as a it's a matter of when you automate, not if you automate. Where historically, I think it's like, oh, we might put in some automation, we might put in some robots. But 
really now it's a proven thing. You mentioned the 5% or so and the people that are going all in like Amware, like the DHLs of the world are going all in on their automation and they're starting to really reap those benefits. So it's starting to become more and more of a proven solution. We were just chatting before the call, Locus hit a billion picks. A few months ago, we're almost all the way to 1.6 billion right now. It's accelerating. So that data, that proven deployment, the number of robots, the amount of automation that's being deployed right now is starting to show that it's more of a proven. So it's really starting to be a matter of the when, not if question. That's really what we're starting to see because the forces that be of why wait, you know, there's less and less excuses, right? As to why you're not automating. And that's a good segue into, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. One less excuse is, is the CapEx or the capital investment that you have to outlay now with technology. So with the robots as a service financing option, do you think that when you're interacting with customers or prospects, that that's a big selling point now more than maybe even the technology itself that, hey, this is affordable. You can lease the equipment or the technology versus put that capital outlay up front. Or do you think people actually want the technology or is it just the financing is just making it more appealing right now? I think it's a little bit of both, right? Because the technology itself is really cool and there's a ton of benefits that we can talk to you know, more about your experiences using Locus Robotics and all the benefits that come with the solution. I think the RAS model is really an enabler. It's an enabler to say, no matter what your warehouse looks like today, we can put robots in it. And you're not having to go to your board of directors for a 10, 20, 30, $100 million project. You're not having to close your operation to scrape your warehouse and put in all new racking and all new facilities and laser measure your floors, you know, that downtime is precious. And then the lead time to put in to design and put in some of these more standard fixed traditional types of automation. We saw supply chain challenges across the industry for a number of different materials. So it was going 16, 18, 24 months before people could get the materials to even put in fixed automation. So you put that on the other scale of RAS, which is in six to eight weeks, I can have an entire fleet of robots in my facility automating my facility and only pay for the ones that I need. I'm sure you've experienced this with your peak operations. You have your core fleet of robots. And then during your peaks, which could be the holiday peak or a seasonal peak or a sale peak, you can just drop more robots in to handle that volume and return the ones you don't need. So you're only paying for what you need and you're not building a church for Easter Sunday and then only having people coming for your daily church service. So I think there's a lot of different factors going into the RAS as an enabler for getting this done. I know you've got a lot of cool new pieces of or expanding the fleet and wanting to automate and kind of all parts of a fulfillment facility. Is it all RAS enabled? Yeah, it's all in that same financing. Yeah, our fleet and our model is really to allow people to make the most of their automation end to end within their warehouse, right? So it can have a mixed fleet. We have the origin robots, which is our most common robot. It's traditional picking and put away robot. And then we have two more robots. One is the Vector, which has an increased payload and a limitless amount of configurations to be able to handle the payload. And that's more for case picking, high volume picking, bigger payloads, put away all of those. We can even move carts around, dunnage. And then we've got the Max, which is the pallet robot up to 3,000 pounds, which really opens up an ability to move product on pallets large amounts of it and do case picking to pallet direct to pallet. So again, it's all the same model because our customers are asking for the same thing. They really don't want to spend that large capital expenditure. They really want to be able to use it as an operating expense. So something I'm really interested in talking about here are the mistakes. A lot of times we hear of all of the success stories and all of the great bits. I'm sure you've been around plenty of them, but what mistakes do you think that brands, customers, make when it comes to automation? I've got my own view on it, but I'm, I'm curious what your perspective is. So a potential prospect customer comes to you and wants to use Locus for a solution, but what mistakes do you see them typically making? 
as to selecting the wrong technology too early, too late into their process, et cetera? I'll say that with a caveat. I think there's two mistakes that just happen in general in this market. One is not having an automation strategy, not fully understanding how you want to roll out automation, not only in your one facility, but how does it affect the rest of your network and how does it affect the flow within the warehouse, right? So if you use a point solution, it can expose other areas where you might have backlog or have not thought about the optimal process. So I think having an automation strategy is key. The second piece is thinking about robotics as kind of like a pilot exercise and throwing in five robots and seeing if that makes a difference. Really, the customers that see the most benefit are the ones that go all in, like we're talking about, where they say, I want to do a 50 fleet, 100 fleet. And I'm going to fully go in. I'm going to say my whole picking area is dedicated to using Locus Origin and this methodology. And with those two mistakes, I think one of the biggest things that we do to help customers avoid those is we go through a concept of operations, much like we did with Amware when you guys were looking at it, where we literally look at your entire warehouse, all the processes where we fit in, what the benefits are going to be, where the bottleneck might be, some considerations and changing so that it's not a situation where you end up with five robots Mm -hmm. and you're like, I didn't realize the value. Well, it's hard to realize the value when you have a mini pilot or when you don't think of it as an entire strategy within your warehouse. So that's at least what we've seen on our side. I'd be curious to hear what yours are. I'm a victim of that, by the way. Example. (laughs) I don't know if it's the fear prior to the call. I was just chatting with Jim and was giving the example of making sure that your own organization is confident in the success of whatever you're deploying and how important that is in the very beginning, because you want whatever technology that you're bringing to be viewed as successful. And so you tend to de-risk it, I think. I think companies tend to de-risk it and kind of dip their toe in the water as opposed to putting themselves out there. And But then they don't see the benefit. It's kind of counterintuitive. You can't just put a couple pieces of technology in there or five or six bots. And I I suspect that's the reason Locust has a minimum maybe of 10 Mm -hmm. typically, because you need that at least to prove out some kind of concept of ops. That's one that I can speak to for sure is we've dabbled with technology early and the benefit wasn't coming on as quick or it was being challenged. And I think our view now is, yeah, we've got to kind of push in a lot harder how did you get over that? Like, how did you help your organization get through the pilot test phase? That's a great question. I think it was kind of the automation strategy. I think when the first piece of real technology showed up, it was cool. and But people were like, it's just one little element and it's not going to transform. And then we added another and then another, and then it's hard to like come to a facility and there's 25 bots or 50 bots. And for people not to walk away with, my gosh, you got more throughput, you're getting it done more efficient, qualities built into the process. And you know your best alternative is manual labor. And so I think it just instantly when people see it and feel it around you, you get bought in. So then we should look at doing it at this facility and that building. But I think what I am also interested in is not just that one piece of technology expanding throughout the network, but those other ones that you just mentioned, like how can they kind of all interact with each other? But I think people just have to see it sometimes. And I'm kind of surprised at how little people still know about technology or what they think about it. They may be aware, but until you start interacting and really feeling it, you don't have a full understanding of its capabilities. But it's an education, I think, to customers and to associates and to your own organization. So I think you're always kind of validating it up, down, sideways. And then the more and more people, enthusiasm gets created really from the results in their testimonies. But I think you need more of it to get that enthusiasm going. It's interesting that you say that because we have a little thing internally and it's called seeing as believing. There's nothing quite like going to a facility that has six, seven, hundred, eight hundred bots running around and no forklifts, right? The educational leap from, oh, this is a robot to a person learning how to interact with it. You know, we'll be at trade shows interacting with people all the time. We have our robots running around and the number of people that just step in front of it to try to say, is it going to run into me? And it never does. And it shocks them, right? So it it really is seeing is believing. (laughs) I'll share a little story with you and Harry, who's our CEO, hopefully will be listening to this podcast. So I had come from DHL 
previously. So I had familiarity with Locus. And when we started looking at the solution, I was really committed to Locus, but I wanted internal support in this example from our CEO. So I was working with Aaron at Locus and I said, Aaron, I think what I really could use here is my boss is coming to town. This is before we signed. I said, if I could get a bot, just one of those bots created and shipped to me, branded Amware, and I'm going to uncreate it, you know, we'll uncreate it and it's not active or anything. But when he's there on site, he's going to see this bot. He's going to see the screen. He's going to see hit the brand on it. And Kate, within like minutes, he's taking pictures. We're doing selfies. It's broadcast around the company. But before that bot was even live, there was enthusiasm because there was a physical piece of equipment there. And that's kind of a story that I like to share about just creating enthusiasm. And all the associates were interacting. And this was a bot not even plugged in, but Mm -hmm. people started to visualize the benefits of it. And it just got a lot of discussion around what it could do, what other customers it could work with. And so to me, I think getting enthusiasm for technology is an important part. So you select the right one ultimately, but going back to the original, I guess, point though on it was, I think customers or brands don't go into technology all in because they just don't know it. They haven't touched it. They haven't felt it. They haven't seen it. And it's just different when you do. And especially when you think about the impact that it's going to have on your workers and your staff in the warehouse. At first, some of our first several deployments, it was robotics was very new to people. They didn't know how they would feel about interacting with a robot. You know, it moves autonomously. It moves around you. It's not human directed, right? But you interact with it. And I think that Once people kind of get the feeling of it's just an iPad, it's just a quick screen. You know, we have customers that name them, that have bot naming contests, that think of them as their little autonomous friends around the warehouse. That amount of stress goes down significantly. And then they're like all in on being a Locus customer and and a Locus associate and being able to work with robots every day. So, you know, I think there's a little bit of hesitancy as well from how is this going to impact my day to day as a warehouse worker, warehouse manager, and how am I going to manage my staff if there's uncertainty there? But also, are they going to take my job as a warehouse worker? And I think the biggest question that we started off at the beginning is, no, we're helping the jobs of your staff get better. They're walking less, they're lifting less, they're not pushing heavy carts around, and they're filling those empty jobs that are just not being filled. So overall, there's a lot of improved work environment coming from working with the robots, but that comes with experience. It comes with actually touching and feeling and seeing the technology work. Yep. We have a customer who's approached us, who's growing 30 or 40%. And when the solution's instantly coming off of what we just deployed with Locus is, hey, Locus would be a great solution for this. We might need 50 bots. So we're engaged in a possible solution there. But that's, I think, just comes with the confidence once you start interacting. But you don't get the confidence if you only had a couple. You'd be bold enough to go all in. Are there customers that you've experienced that have kind of gone all in? Is there any project examples that come to mind where somebody grew their entire warehouse and is starting to use all of the different features and functionality that Locus is offering? I've got a couple of different stories, examples. One is a large apparel footwear retailer, and they had so much success with Locus, not only with their 3PL, but also their own facilities that when they built new facilities, they built that with Locus in mind, so much so that their warehouses don't even have forklifts. So imagine a full facility. I was there a few months ago, a full facility where the trucks come in, they unload the cases, they put the cases directly onto a Locus bot. The Locus bot takes it to the put away location. The workers put the cases away on the shelf. When the product is ready to be picked, you have a Locus bot come and do the pick with the worker. It goes to pack out and it goes straight out to parcel. No forklifts at all, no pallets, no challenges with any of that. And their throughput is incredible. They had an amazing peak season. So you think about that situation and then you think about other customers that are using the fleet. We've had several go lives in the last several months that include the vector and the origin working simultaneously together where you know, if you have orders that have that bigger capacity that's needed or you need more on the bot, you could be picking to a locus origin or to a vector depending on what the order flow looks like for the day. 
Or if you have non-conveyable big heavy items, you have a vector that's running basically, you know, a bus route that's taking items from one side of the facility to the other that's completely bypassing the conveyor. So there's a couple of those examples and we're just continuing to see more and more. Locust does really, really well in those brownfield environments where you can literally just drop the bots in in your existing racking in your existing facility. But we're seeing more customers that have designed or optimized their warehouse entirely for Locust and the automation capabilities there. The possibilities are endless, right? (laughs) Yeah, that's awesome. Especially for companies that are building facilities with Locust in mind or around it, that's got to feel really great as an organization. Are there other things that you're getting in in terms of feedback from customers beyond helping us increase productivity two to three times? Is there any other benefits being reported up to you from current customers? Yeah, there's several. I think the ability to handle volume and go up and down as you need to handle those peaks without having to hire a ton of temp labor. Or if you do have temp labor, the ability to onboard people in 15 minutes instead of three days to learn how to pick is huge for the customers. Like I said earlier, it's just an iPad. I'm sure your team members have experienced too. Sometimes we'll take prospects or executive teams to a customer site and the CEOs out there learning how to pick on the floor with the pickers, right? It's that easy. So if there's those. We have our whole new Locust One platform that we launched a few weeks ago at Promat, which really is this next generation of a robotic control system, if you will. It's a whole platform. All of the bots are simultaneously on the same platform. And no matter what bot you're working with, whether it's Origin, Vector, or Max, the user interface is the same. So whether you're learning how to do picking or put away or case picking, it's all the same user interface and all the bots are on the same network. So that's a huge benefit because they're not having to train how to use one type of automation versus another type of automation versus another type of automation. It's all very connected together and very intuitive. And then from a data perspective, you can see here's how we're performing and picking and packing and put away and all these different functions within the warehouse. And here's a training opportunity. Here's where we can do something a little bit better. Here's a team that's really knocking it out of the park with their throughput numbers. And then I think the last big piece that we're seeing is this budget flexibility. I know there's a lot of economic talk about what's going on in the economy and what's going on with consumer spending and all of that. And again, back to that RAS, it's really being able to be flexible. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the new trend that we're starting to hear more and more about is this interoperability. We had two exhibits at Promat where we had two partners that we worked with where it's robot to robot integration. So we launched the Berkshire Gray automatic sortation put wall with the Locus Origin and Vector. And we had a demo with Fanuc, which is a robotic arm that was pulling cases off of the robot as well. So that's one I think we'll start to see more and more as a benefit, being able to have that interoperability as an upcoming trend. One last question I wanted to ask was about the gamification, or I mm-hmm. refer to it as gamification. I think you probably do too. But do you see anything with just kind of from an associate perspective of using it, you know, as a recognition tool, reward and recognition of any particular stories that exist out there? You know, that's an interesting question because you'd be surprised how often people ask about it and how some facilities decide that they're just going to let people track it on their own and some actually do it with incentives or prizes. So what I've seen at customer sites is every picker or every warehouse associate has their name and their badge, you know, number or their picker number, what their numbers are for the day, right? So they use it to compete with themselves. They use it to compete with each other, with the teams. It's cool when there's a shift change and a shift end where the warehouse team member, team lead is like morning shift kick butt and did this number of units, afternoon yes. shift. Let's see if we can beat that. And they'll do a pizza party or they'll do donuts or whatever the food of the day is for those teams. So I've seen a little bit of that. Some customers have decided to do some more top team lead incentives and stuff. So it's an interesting feature. I think It's a little bit less in like Europe where GDPR is a concern and you can't track some of that individual data. But at least for the North American teams, it's a little bit of fun and a little bit of competition Mm -hmm. to be, I was number one picker for the day or the week or the month, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So that's great. I would ordinarily ask where can people go to find more about Locust, but I think anybody who's listening to the podcast or has gone to a pro mat sees Locust (laughs) properly displayed 
in great prominence, but for those that may not have seen Locus at the trade shows, where can people go to find more about Locus? Yeah. So we're all over the place. www.locusrobotics.com is probably a really great place to start. Educate yourself about our solution. We also have a really great social media presence on LinkedIn. You can check out all of our videos and team members and their experiences and featuring our customers like you guys and your stories, Twitter, Instagram, you can see all kinds of fun stuff there. And then we're at a lot of different trade shows. So you can actually come and see the bots in action on your own as well. As we were talking about earlier, seeing is believing there's nothing quite like seeing the bots in action in person. So we encourage you to come visit us at any number of automation and warehousing shows. And that's a great place to see it in action, literally at the trade shows. Well, excellent. Thanks a lot, Kate. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. It's always fun to hear from other warehousing professionals and what your experiences are. So thank you for having me. Our pleasure. And thanks for all of our listeners. This concludes our episode of Unboxing Fulfillment, the modern B2C fulfillment podcast. Stay safe, everyone. 